Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to tonight's program with Inforum at the Commonwealth Club. I'm Daya Lakshmi Narayanan. I'm a comedian and storyteller and host of The Moth here in San Francisco. And we're joined by founder and chief instigator of Parlay House, which is a series of intimate salons across the country meant to foster meaningful and authentic connections between women. Tonight, we'll discuss Parlay House's roots, chronicled in the book, The Parlay Effect, how female connections can change the world. Please help me welcome Anne Devereaux Mills, everyone. We will have about 45 minutes of conversation, and then we will open it up for questions. So we've heard Parlay House a few times. I have attended Parlay House. I've been a speaker, uh, just to let everyone know my, my, my conflict of Full interest confessions. here. Yes. Uh, I was struck uh, by how real it was and that no one wanted to go home. I think the only reason I went home is you're like, you can take some of the biscotti with you. And I was like, I actually Great. thought we ran out of champagne. <laughs> <laughs> so what is, what is Parlay House? What makes it special? Parlay House is an organization that I founded when I actually moved here. Um, I moved here in 2012 after sort of a, a life explosion where um, I lost my job, my health, well, it was really my health and therefore my job, and my youngest daughter was leaving uh, to go to college, and everything that had defined me in the first 50 years of my life left, and without being able to define myself by what I did for a living or whose mother I was or whether I was at the gym in the morning, I was lost. And it caused me to reflect. It caused me to think about what are my values and what do I want the second half of my life to be like. And I realized that I would much rather have a group of friends who were supportive and with whom I could be intimate and where I could sort of be my real self because in the business world, once I lost power, I lost almost everybody. And I realized that I was living sort of a very transactional life and that that wasn't fulfilling. And so I just sort of experimented by inviting 12 women to my home. And I didn't know anybody. I moved here to be with the amazing guy who is now my husband, but he wasn't at the time. And I just sort of took a flyer and dropped Kira, my youngest, off at school and kept heading west. And we bought a house and I needed to figure out how to create friendships because in the world of advertising where I was a multiple time CEO, I didn't have friends. Mm -hmm. I had associates. I had colleagues in a, in a semi-trusting sense, but I didn't have friends. Mm -hmm. And so this Parlay House is now an organization that's global. We've got 5,000 members. We get together in homes. The idea is invite strangers into your home. Invite people who you don't hang out with, who aren't the same as you, because once you start having vulnerable conversations in safe spaces, you realize how many things you share. Wow. So you basically encourage people who you don't know to come to your home. I do. Wow. <laughs> You're all welcome. And, and, uh, <laughs> so what do your loved ones think about this, that you open up your home, you have strangers like me uh, coming and eating your biscotti, making connections? It, some people might think that's weird. I think they think it's risky. Mm. Uh, you know, we haven't had deep conversations about this because I just do what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but... I, you know, I think, I think a lot of people think that's, I don't know if I would do that. I don't know if I would open my home to strangers. But I think the bigger part is opening your heart to strangers. Like stuff is stuff. Mm. And private spaces are, there's a lot of science that says your private space really tells people a lot about you. And so you're revealing things by letting people into your home. But I'm about revealing what's inside. And that's the much scarier piece, but the much more important piece of the whole Parlay House movement. Mm. And so it is a movement because it's not just meeting in person in people's homes. You have written a book called The Parlay Effect. And uh, you're, here's the book. I feel very Vanna White here. <laughs> and you're going to be signing it. So You're dating yourself. <laughs> my kids are like, who's Vanna White? Vanna White, my <laughs> parents still watch, Pat Sajak and Vanna White don't age. Like they've they been on, and my parents watch them, 
and it's like consistency for them. So, <laughs> uh, and Alex Trebek too. Like, absolutely. Hopefully, he'll be he'll be feeling better soon. But what is what is the book? What is the book about? And why did you write it? Well, the book is sort of a, a I'd call it a mishmash. Part of it is this sort of crazy personal journey that I went on. Um, first being a, m a multiple time CEO and single mom and cancer patient sort of all at the same time. And that took a lot of kind of grit. Mm. And I thought grit is what gets us through life. And then when everything exploded and I realized that even with grit, I was lonely and vulnerable. Um, so I wrote the book as, as a way of not only telling my story and being vulnerable to the world, which is kind of freaky to put yourself out there with so much openness, but also to say that you don't have to be a CEO and it doesn't matter what you do for a living because you have the ability to create meaningful cascades for other people um, through your actions and through generosity. And, and this is sort of a, a leap into the book, but um, the parlay effect was really something we sort of realized as the movement grew. And I saw a few people here who were, who were among the original sort of 20 members, and we had no idea when we started having these conversations the level of relevance and how it was filling not only something for us, but a piece that was missing for many people in their lives. Having a s safe space to say, oh my God, y you feel that way? Me too. This was before the Me Too movement mm -hmm. meant something very specific. Mm -hmm. We were saying Me Too about embarrassing health issues or you know mental illness or um, dealing with the narcissists in our lives or whatever the topics all of a sudden when you volunteered that terrible secret y you were sort of freed to feel better mm -hmm. and then what happens when you feel better is all of a sudden you're aware of the people around you and you can start initiating things because you're seeing others so we started to see sort of a pay it forward um, series of stories that would come back around that it all started at Parlay House. And so I started writing this book to capture the stories of small actions that lifted from woman to woman to woman. And I realized I was feeling like an, I needed to be an overachiever in that too. Mm -hmm. It might not be good enough. And so I uh, partnered with a professor at Berkeley, she, uh, Dr. Serena Chen. She's an amazing uh, social scientist and professor. And we did a, uh, a research study to track what was happening. Is this just another version of pay it forward among people who have met? And what we found, we, we, we did this sort of... Um, set up research, and I don't mean it was the results were calculated, but failure was calculated. And so we, we sort of said, okay, let's bucket a third of our blind 350 person survey, online survey group into a bucket we're calling givers. Mm -hmm. The givers were the people who were the first to do something kind, generous, inclusive, thoughtful. And we asked them to tell us the story. Can you think of a time that, um, you did something and the person that was on the receiving end actually was moved by this mm. event. And they, this group told us their stories. And we had the second group of people who were the receivers. And the re receivers, we asked, is there a time that someone did something for you that changed your behavior in some way that cascaded to another person? And then we thought, oh, shoot, what if people can't think of anything? You know, this is just 18 to 44-year-old random people completing an online survey. If they come up, can't come up with a story, we've ruined our, all of our research. So we're like, let's create a bucket mm -hmm. and call them the witnesses. You didn't initiate anything. No one's ever done anything nice for you. <laughs> but you might know of something. Yeah. And we thought people were going to tell us stories of, you know, someone bought, them, bought a Starbucks for the next person right. or someone bought fast food for the person behind them. And we did get those stories. But we also got this unbelievable result where the witnesses would say things like, well, I was parked outside of 7-Eleven. I was just kind of hanging out. And this guy in the truck next to me walked into 7-Eleven. And when he came out, he handed a sandwich to the homeless guy that was outside. And that homeless guy walked across the street and shared a sandwich. Mm. Okay, that's one became two or three bites of food for somebody and a lovely observation. And then the guy said, so I realized I can do that. And the next time I went to 7-Eleven, 
I did the same thing. So all of a sudden, one action cascaded and provided at least a few bites of food for six people plus. And, and what it said to us was this cascade that we were seeing is not linear. Mm. And that by doing things that are good in an overt way, you know, we're sort of taught as a society to keep your little good deeds to yourself and don't brag and don't be loud about it. But the reality is we're setting examples for each other. Mm. And at this crazy time when some of our public officials are not setting examples of morality yeah. or of choices that we feel good about, it seemed incredibly empowering that someone doesn't need money, they don't need power, they don't need influence, they just need to give of something that's core to themselves. They might coach somebody at work who's mm -hmm. struggling. They might tell someone she's got green food on her teeth so she doesn't go into a meeting. Yeah. I mean, there's some, there's some really small things that anybody is capable of doing. We had welfare moms say, I had nothing for my baby, mm -hmm. and this woman I don't even know whose baby is older than mine dropped stuff off at my door and now I have things that my baby's grown out of wow. that I can give to another person. And so it's very nice to be sort of finding this, this, this aha that is a solution at a time when many of us feel sort of powerless. Mm. You talked about earlier in your life you had associates but not really uh, friends, but you were very successful. You had, um, you know, run companies, you'd served on boards. What's the difference between the I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine, transactional favor, currency, as opposed to the parlay effect and paying it forward? How is it different? Well, one is this expectation of reciprocity. I don't know how many people lose friendships, lose connections, because they feel like they're always the ones that are giving. Mm. And by j evaluating that they're not getting back, I'm always the one who drives the kids to soccer. I'm always the one who, you know, steps in and volunteers. I'm a and when you start measuring and comparing, it's very easy to feel angry mm. and feel resentful. But when you reframe it, in a way that you can say, um, I am doing this for the sake of feeling good at the end of the day that I might have done something to help someone else, and I'm not tallying that. I'm just tallying myself. It's incredibly empowering. And we stop having these scales of haves and have-nots. We have this self-reflection of, am I the person I wanted to be? Do I? F if not, it's okay. You can have a bad day, and you can have been an asshole. I mean, really, we all are human. Right. Yeah. But when you when we stop comparing and start sharing, it makes a dramatic difference to other people. And and that's sort of the the theme of Parley House when people come to the event. There's a speaker, and people are connecting with each other. But it's not a networking event. It's an anti-networking event. I hate networking. Mm. I find it superficial and fake mm. and transactional, mm -hmm. and you're doing it because the person you're meeting is either in your industry or they can do something for you or they might hire you one day or you might hire them one day. Or, you know, there's all this ulterior motive to really getting to know people mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, I, I think that the best thing we can possibly do is have a couple of rules at Parlay House, which is non-transaction, non-extraction. So mm -hmm. you can, it, people get hired as a result of relationships at Parlay House, sure. for sure. They lift each other up, they confide in each other, but they don't come as the person starting the nonprofit who wants the free work from the marketing person, because that marketing person might have one night a month when that's all about her. She's mm. usually at the bottom of the hierarchy of who gets cared for because she's taking care of the family and she's taking care of work and she's taking So she has her night and the last thing she wants to do is show, show up right. and be asked to do something by somebody else. So those are our rules. You know, you, you're open, you bring strangers with you. If, if this would be a meaningful thing to someone, you volunteer and bring another person. Mm -hmm. um, but that's it. No networking, no extraction, no transactions. And it's magic. Wow. Yeah. So how do people uh, internalize that? Or do you have like a referee that runs around and be like, hey, no extraction, no <laughs> transaction, and then just shut them down, you know? Like, I've, I have managed the fine art of <laughs> uh, rerouting. Okay. Oh, I like it. Rerouting. And, and I think we encourage everybody to sort of have the ability to say, I love hearing about what you're doing, and that's great. This, I'm going to sort of take the time to enjoy this space for now, but I'm proud of you. You know, you don't, you don't have to just 
shut people. They're, they're telling, while they're asking you, they're also telling you what's important to them, what they're focused on. You can get a lot of information even from somebody who's sort of has an extractive motive. But I think mm -hmm. it's good practice for all of us, mm. uh, you know, whether it's in family relationships or in work, in any aspect of our lives, to learn how to hold on to the nugget of good and then just route around that stuff that was sort of offensive or inappropriate. Right. <laughs> uh, so you uh, mentioned uh, a few things about uh, cancer, about uh, one of the Parlay House events was about how to deal with narcissists in your life. One was That's about- That's actually our most popular. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Wow. We've done it in we've done it twice in San Francisco, in New York, and in DC. It's sold out every time. The oh number of narcissists goodness. is mind boggling. Wow. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, so what if they come to Parlay House? Is there a way? They they this is the amazing thing about narcissists. They deny that they're narcissists. Oh my god. So they won't we we have had that. Actually we did a, a an event in London, and it was not directly about narcissism, but it was with, um, with a, th a therapist who was an expert, and we broke into some subgroups for conversations, and it was played back to me that there was someone who was well-known in among a small group who was a narcissist and spent the entire time claiming that they'd never met one in their lives. So, oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we've got to have some mirrors. <laughs> um, but, but you talk about um, this idea that we can connect over an embarrassing health issue or something in our lives, maybe a narcissist we've encountered. So you reference B'nai Brown in, in the book, and you know we love her. Uh, tell me a little bit um, more about this vulnerability. You seem so at ease being vulnerable with the things that you talk about in the book, whether it's job loss, health, career, your daughter's leaving, and you're not having friends. And how do you have the strength to be vulnerable over and over again. And what if you take that risk and someone says something mean, like, well, that, you got a lot going on there, or they just are like, sucks to be you. And like, what if they <laughs> say something mean? Like, how do you come back from that and you've just opened up your heart? Well, first of all, I found out, I figured out they almost never say something mean. I mean, uh, so much about of the work that I do is about trusting other humans. Mm -hmm. You know, you trusting them with their home, trusting them with your heart. But I have almost never had someone do that. And then I think one of the reasons I was so happy that you were on stage with me tonight is if you have the ability to flip an insult into something funny, <laughs> you can diffuse it pretty right. quickly. Right. And you know, I don't mind saying it did, that did suck. Mm. But the amazing thing was until I got into what I call the space in between, which is after what you knew and what was your path and before you have figured out what's next, you have to spend a lot of time in this transitional space. And it's an incredibly painful space mm. to be in the middle of of not knowing who you are and how to define yourself. And for me, because I was such an achiever and such a perfectionist, you know, in those early years, those, those, those heavy duty work parenting years, if someone had criticized me or said, I might've actually felt hurt or vulnerable, but that was because I wasn't feeling. I was spending so much, so many years doing mm. and achieving and be, trying to be Wonder Woman and using grit in, as my intense motivation. And then when all that was stripped away and all I wanted to do was, was sob, mm. <laughs> I sort of got, got past that and realized that when I said things that I would have hidden in my achieving years, and now I'm in my, my feeling years, mm. I was embraced. Like people, strangers would comfort me, would say, oh my God, I can't even imagine. Or you're so brave and that gives me the permission to tell you my truth too. And that's something that we don't have the safety in our society to mm. do often enough these days. You know, if you look at whether it's fake news or any of the, the presidential candidates, regardless of your mm. political views, everyone is looking for that opening to stab you. Mm. And I want to move us to a place, now you can't maybe on a presidential campaign, um, I want to move us to a place where imperfection is assumed, mm, mm -hmm. where we, we have safety to say, this was hard and I failed and I learned from failing, but I'm probably going to fail again. Mm -hmm. And all of this is part of the, the human experience. And I embrace you when you fail and I hope you'll embrace 
me in my imperfection. Mm. Do you think that when women uh, take the chance or, the, or have the bravery to be vulnerable and share and open up their heart, even publicly or fail publicly, we are uh, penalized more for it than men are. Um, so, you know, uh, in, the, in the last election when Hillary Clinton ran, there was, you know, d regardless of who you voted for, uh, there was criticism that, you know, she, we couldn't get to know her. She wasn't vulnerable enough. But then she does something and they're like, oh, that, that, was, that was too much. So is there still this icky space that we as women have to navigate when we put ourselves out there and we fail, whereas it's maybe not true for men? I would say yes and no. You know, I don't know the science about tears, mm -hmm. for example, because I remember feeling if I um, was in a, a, you know, either I had to let people go or I was given negative feedback, I remember feeling tearful and how terrible that was, how badly that was viewed by my male counterparts, bosses. So there isn't really a space for emotion in a workplace it, it, on sort of traditional levels. And so I think and because everybody's uncomfortable with vulnerability, we are criticized if mm. we show too much vulnerability. On the other hand, um, one of the really interesting trends that I've seen when I speak is at the end of these, I, don't, I didn't really see how many men we have in the room. I don't think we have too many tonight. But when I speak to co-ed groups, the very first question that I've been getting is from a man who will say, when are you going to launch Parlay House for Men? Because I have no space to be my vulnerable mm. self. Mm. And I think it, we're criticized for being vulnerable. We're also allowed as yes. women to be vulnerable. And men, for the most part, aren't. Mm. And so it's, a, you know, it's an interesting and loaded question as we try to lift each other up. And there's no way that all of us are going to achieve what we want to achieve in any aspect of our lives if we do it as women only. Mm -hmm. Um, as men are seeing now, they sort of can't, can't do it as, as men only. But we've got to create room for vulnerability across, across the board. And, and it might just be that we have to show we're brave enough and do it first. Have you found either in your research or just anecdotally, what is the line between vulnerability and oversharing or TMI? Uh, <laughs> because in this age of, you know, social media, uh, sometimes I'm just like, unfollow, that's kind of messy, you know, and, and I'm like, am I that way? You know, maybe I should. So how do we know how much to open up ourselves? And is there sort of a guideline, like how much do we share? Or is it just based on uh, owning who you are? And then however other people react, that's their business. Well, I think there's, I think there's some of each, mm -hmm. right? So, some of it is I am who I am. You don't like that I share too much. I might not be the right person for you, and that's okay. But I think that there's a more important component of all of this, and it's about seeing each other. Mm. So I've sometimes, and my cancer was female and very personal, and I've talked to rooms of people when I've gotten pretty descriptive, and sometimes it made them too uncomfortable, and they sort of would put up a barrier, and I was like, okay, can't quite be that graphic with what I'm saying. And so we when we are not reading the person mm -hmm. that we're talking to mm -hmm. and seeing what's their line. You know, I know people who would just talk about anything and everything sure. and share all the time, and I could say whatever. And then there are people who aren't there yet. And so I, and, and when you're meeting a stranger, I think instead of just pouring out your heart, sure. starting with a bit of information, seeing what the reaction is, see what they share back, see whether they're looking for another glass of wine behind you or, you know, somebody yeah. else to talk to and, and pay attention. And a lot of my work is about seeing people. It's when you see someone that you are able to pull them forward too, because you're really looking at them and you're acknowledging that there's something, you know, sometimes we've, we've gotten feedback from members that say, when you saw me across the room and smiled and acknowledged something, that was the most meaningful part of my evening. Mm. And it's, sometimes that's all it takes to lift someone up is the, I see you and I, I, as a human, and I'm nodding at you. And even if we haven't shared total words about what this is about, that's, that's one small thing that actually 
is moving and dif- and someone can walk out the door and say, I, I just was seen. And that's mm. the first time in a long time someone has seen me. I, I want to talk more about that, the kind of the space in between and seeing people. So for you, it's it's not just in, again, a transactional or superficial way. It's not just, I, I love what you're wearing, which I actually do love what Thank you're you. wearing. Thank <laughs> you. Goldenrod is the color. Uh, but it's also about um, seeing your joy, having your family surprise you today, um, coming into the green room, uh, your daughter holding your hand and having, you know, that moment. So how do we shift um, into seeing who people really are um, when we are conditioned so much to compliment the outside or their fashion or what they look like? I don't think it's an either or. In fact, I had this fabulous therapist when I was going through all of this and I started noticing a pattern that every time she knew I loved fashion Mm. and shoes and whatever. And every time I walked in the room, she would notice something that could be a a 30 second icebreaker of a conversation where I would say, because I like to sew clothes or whatever, I would say I made that or, oh, I just got these on sale or whatever the the reference point was. And it was just a door opener to a a deeper conversation. Mm. So I actually think if you don't know what to say to someone, Mm. but you notice Mm. something, how does your hair get so shiny? How's Mm. your, you know, I'm a shy person. Mm. So it, it took a lot for me to get into a situation where I can walk into a room of strangers and have a conversation um, because I would prefer to just talk one-on-one with someone in the corner of the room. Mm. But I've found these door openers that very likely are about what you first see before you really know someone completely perfect for disarming you know, someone who might not know how to start a conversation and then get into the real grit. Uh, by the way, uh, keratin treatment. That's how I get my hair <laughs> so shiny. <laughs> Another parlay house tip. Uh, so when we move past um, that level, how do we start noticing without, uh, again, uh, in, in my profession, a lot of what I do, I am always noticing people. I'm noticing uh, what changed, what's different, what are they paying attention to. So to really see someone, we give them that moment. How do you start noticing people uh, and it be a respectful notice and not like a, a, wow, I'm really staring at this person trying to find something to say? Like, how do you do it? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Mm. I mean, I think intense direct eye contact for more than a minute is probably not, you know, okay. a really good thing. Some okay. blinking, some words are helpful. <laughs> oh, blinking. Okay, okay good. <laughs> but I, but it's really it really starts with asking asking a question, and it's not a deep question to start. But you know we don't get asked what we think and what we feel as humans very often. We sort Mm. of have to find ways to volunteer it. So I think if you give someone an opening, Mm. what did you think about that? It's one of the reasons why I don't just invite strangers over to socialize. We always have content Mm. because it's that united experience that grounds everybody on some sort of level. And because people self-select, oh, I'm interested in narcissism, or we have one of our, our best events that we do every year is bring a book that somehow tells part of your life story. Mm. So instead of framing yourself, I'm, you know, the boss Mm -hmm. or I'm a school teacher, you're, here's the story I identified. I bought, brought this book because I identified with this character in this way, or my mother read this to me as a child, or this book changed the way I felt about whatever. And having those grounded experiences is a perfect way to then get into the conversations without having to have the one minute stare down. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I like that because, uh, you, you started by talking about everything that's happening in our world right now and some of the anxiety we might feel or the tension or this loss of control. So what if we start doing this? What if we start, uh, having this effect by noticing, by inviting people in, opening our hearts, uh, what what could the future look like? What would you want that future to be when we have these true meaningful connections? You know, I, I wish I could completely see into the future, but I can tell you just based on sort of the two steps of a cascade that we can track that happen is that if we have a world where we're not walking down the street, looking down at our phone, but we might notice the person walking the other way and acknowledge them. Or if when we're walking through a door, 
not only do we sort of maybe hold it for the next person behind us, but we might even look them in the eye in some way and s say hello, all of a sudden we start becoming human to each other and not a door opener or someone who's blocking the sidewalk or, you know, the other things that when you're in the rush to do instead of to feel, you might forget about humanity around mm. you. So I think the, the big aha of this whole book is that when we stop to see each other in whatever way and then we feel seen by someone in some way as, as a human, as that look across the room, all of a sudden it doesn't feel like such an angry place and we start to recognize that we're having even eye contact connections with people who would have been invisible to us before and what a great way to start seeing each other's humanity and that way you know, if it trickles to a political level or if it trickles to a power level or if it trickles to a, a hiring level, we start to see each other in the context of humanity and not head count and bodies and, you know, all of these abstract terms that we mm. use when we don't want to view each other's humanity, but we want to explain difficult decisions. Mm. So many of us, I mean, there's so many people in this room, we've probably all... Um, you know, read the different books, we've leaned in, we've tried to ask the question without our voice going up at the end, we've tried to dress <laughs> nice but not too nice, you know, wear the nice lip color but don't make it too bold. There's so many things that we're trying to do as, as women and as human beings and also to be like, how do I be my authentic self and yet how, are, how is this person going to perceive me, whether in the workplace or giving a talk or that kind of thing? Um, the parlay effect and the book, how is it different from maybe some of the models that we've seen before um, that, quote, empower women or tell us what to do or how to talk or what to be like in the workplace and in our relationships? I think it's a lo what I've done is ask a lot more questions and have you sort of assess yourself rather than feel that you're being assessed by society. And, you know, I'm a sort of naturally conforming person who wants to be liked, and therefore, if I don't think about what are my values at the core of me at the end of my life. And I, you know, I'm, I'm lucky in that I had to consider, is this the end of my life at a relatively young age when, when many of us don't ask that question. And when you ask that question, you know, what would I want my legacy to be? What, what, what will I want the the outcome to be, it's generally not that I was the CEO of a healthcare advertising agency in New York. Mm -hmm. It's that I was a role model to up and coming women. It's that I was willing to say things in public places that allowed people to find their voice. It was that I chose generosity over selfishness when I could. It's that if I made a mistake, I made it okay for other people to make mm. mistakes by saying, I messed up. <laughs> right. And look, you wouldn't believe this idiotic thing that I did mm. today. And Because when we say that, even if we do it in a light way and in jest, it's still, you know, I can be... I have been told this. I don't believe it to be true. But I have been told that I'm an intimidating person. Hmm. And that shocks me because I don't see myself as intimidating or perfect or, you know, I am hard on myself all the time mm -hmm. about my faults. Mm -hmm. But I think it's amazing when you're aware that that's whatever you, the people's perception of you is. Getting that feedback is not a criticism, mm. but it's really good for recalibrating. Oh, if I am someone, am I being intimidating right now? Because, boy, I don't mean to be, but I might, my confidence might be viewed as that. Mm. And so I think there's a whole big piece of what my book is about that includes introspection and mm. not self-criticism because mm -hmm. I'm way too critical about myself as sure. it is, but awareness of who I am and what I value and a willingness to ask how that's working for me right now. Mm. Well, one of the things that I noticed about um, the examples in the book, the social science, as well as Parley House, is that one of your goals was to, uh, we talk a lot about diversity and inclusion, your goal was really to connect with people who are different from you, racially diverse, socioeconomically diverse, um, maybe their parents, maybe they're single moms, maybe they don't have kids, uh, different professions. 
How do we connect with people who are different when so much of our lives involves being around people who are like us? But isn't it boring to be around people that are just <laughs> like us all the time? I mean, that's what I love is being in a room and talking to a 20-year-old about their experience or someone who finally has gotten to the stage in their lives where work isn't the thing that they're focused on or someone who... Um, has had very different experiences being in society than me as sort of a, 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 a strong, attractive white woman. I mean, I don't know half of these things. I'm missing experiences that other people have had that make me not only more sensitive and more aware, but make me think. And, you know, I think one of the biggest mistakes we make as we get to be adults is thinking that we get it now. We've, mm -hmm. We know everything. We figured it out. And now we're just sort of, we know where we're going and we're looking straight ahead. But, you know, I was forced to look 360 degrees at 50 years old. And the things that I saw to the side of me or that I'd missed in a past iteration of myself were far more interesting than the familiarity of the same people mm. with the same interests in the same socioeconomic group doing the same things. How have you managed to bring people in um, who are different? I mean, you have a passion for social justice, um, racial equality, um, queer people in your life. Uh, that's kind of come from your own values. How do you create that for your organizations now that it's across the world? It's yeah. in. Um, well, it's it's one of our core best practices mm -hmm. is if you don't start with a diverse group at the very beginning, people do tend to hang out with people like themselves, whether it's th that's their stage in life, whether it's that's who their next door neighbor is, you know, that's their sibling. And so we try really, really hard to populate when we found these new cities and we're now in nine cities mm -hmm. around the globe and expanding super, super fast is telling our, our hosts in those cities the most important thing you can do beyond the non-transaction is get the 20-year-old in there, get the women of color in there, get the people who are stay-at-home moms in there because their perspective is very different than someone who is, has run four companies. And how do we start to embrace that range of people really early on? Mm. And that, that, you know, there's a lot of science that shows that that's true for successful companies as well, whether, mm. it's, whether it's integrated boards, whether it's senior management teams, you know, in the business world, there's tons of social science that says when you're challenged in your thinking and when you're with people who think differently, live differently, behave differently, see the world differently, solve problems differently, you're a far more efficient and effective company. Mm -hmm. And we've found that to be completely true at Parlay House. And so that's just one of our best practices. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, what in the process of writing this book, because you are so open, uh, what was hard about writing this book? What did you encounter any setbacks or any frustrations? Yes, I was rejected by, well, first I had a great agent mm. who turned out to not necessarily give me direction that made me successful. So I spent a couple of years writing a book that was just capturing the stories of these cascades of events. It wasn't particularly my story. There was no social science. I'm not sure if it was good or not good. It was so many iterations ago. But I thought, wow, I have one of these great New York agents, and I, here I am, and I'm going to push forward. And no one wanted my book. Mm. So I hired another agent who I thought... I was told, yes, he, he really loves baseball and he's an expert on baseball books, but <laughs> I, I think he's done a couple of books about women's issues and he's going to be a good advocate. I just, my gut was I should not hire this guy. <laughs> like, but I didn't listen to myself. Mm -hmm. And it was, sure enough, another iteration of the book that nobody wanted. And so I finally gathered around an amazing group of mostly women, but some men with incredible skills as well, and built my own team. And, you know, the publishing world is sort of flipped on its head at the moment. It used to be publishers were all powerful, and there's no way you could bring a book to market on your own. And because everyone has been diluted and, you know, books don't, there are too many books and they don't make enough money and there are all sorts of reasons why the publishing world is not as powerful as it used to be. I did it with friends, and some of them are sitting in the audience. People, when I was about to give up, said, don't give up. My, my kids and my husband, who said, you really have something important here. And my, 
quelling that own voice inside of me that said, are you kidding? You're not a writer. Mm. Like, who's going to want to hear? I'm bored by my own story, right? I lived my story. I know my story. It's, it doesn't feel that interesting when you're putting a book together that's both um, personal and self-help. Mm. I mean, I couldn't sort of write it if I hadn't learned it. So I think there's that doubt that comes back all the time of what the hell am I doing? Mm. This is, I'm not a writer. I still would say I'm not a writer, mm. but five years ago, I would have said, are you kidding? I'm not a community organizer. I don't, I don't hold events. I don't, I'm shy. I don't do this, mm. but you know, I, I think this is part of the constant testing of ourselves and trying new things and failing and wearing the outfit that doesn't look good and saying, not going to do that in a photo again. You know, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's all about the journey. What, what happened with that outfit? What was it was not good. It was in my first TED Talk. And I was just like, what the hell was I thinking? I look like a brick house. A brick house. Wow. <laughs> Wide oh, wow. brick house. Oh, my. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so uh, no brick house dresses no. on TED Talks. Okay. Uh, how... Um, and, and once you started thinking, you know, I don't need this baseball agent. Uh, I got my team. I can do this. What, I mean, what's happened now, now that the book is out, it's on well, Amazon? Well, it's kind of amazing because it's out this morning. This morning. And so this morning, yeah, thank yeah. you. <laughs> I had no idea what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. So, you know, trying to break the very bad habit of first thing you do when you open your eyes, checking your phone, uh, That's exactly what I did this morning. Okay. And I started seeing flashes and, you know, people, and I realized that in this transactional career, mm -hmm. there's still people who want to know people that are doing stuff. So even those who are not there for me in the times when the times got tough are still interested in hearing what happened to my journey when I veered off of that career path. And the people who are really my friends sent me flowers, mm -hmm. had lunch with me. Mm -hmm. You know, she, I had a daughter and a sister fly to surprise me mm -hmm. and show up. And, you know, the things that I was looking for when I was lonely, mm. when I um, lost everything and didn't know who I was, the desire to have four quarters instead of a hundred pennies as friends, mm. they're here. It happened. Um, you, uh, you talk about, um, the kind of the difficulty of your journey as well as at a very crucial part, part of your life, uh, being vulnerable and then not having a job as a result of that. And then you talk about being in another position where you had to let people go. So now that the book is out, it came out this morning, you're talking yeah. very vulnerably. How do you handle some of those, um, difficult uh, relationships that maybe you maybe yeah. you felt wronged in the past, or you may have inadvertently wronged someone. How do you? This is this is a really great question because um, my sister Rachel is here today, and she runs a business called the Letter Farmer, which is this incredible business in Seattle where she fills up her uh, Sprinter van with letter writing equipment and, you know, whether it's cards or stationery or guides about how to write a letter or calligraphy pens. And she drives to different parts of Seattle. And whether it's a company or it's the homeless or it's the person on the street, she reminds them how to talk to people, how to communicate ideas, how to share uh, important pieces of themselves in a written form that's not abbreviated like LOL or, you know, <laughs> whatever, laugh your ass off uh -huh. is. <laughs> and um, I was sort of proud of her and, and putting something up on social media about what she did. And a woman who also has a stationary business who had worked for me with the last company that I had run, she had a side business that was also doing sort of beautiful written things. And she wrote to me and she said, I love what your sister's doing. That is so cool. And I said, you're right. It is really cool. And now that you've reached out to me and we haven't talked in a couple of years, you were someone I had to let go. And corporate was telling me what I could and couldn't say. And it was a layoff and we couldn't be apologetic. And I knew how badly that affected you. And I was not brave enough to say, wait, I'm picking my heart over mm. legal coaching. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't 
kind enough, and I'm sorry that I didn't see your humanity. I didn't necessarily have a choice. I couldn't have done it over in a different way, but I want you to know that I didn't, I wish I'd done it better. And she said, wow, that's super meaningful, and I just had to let someone go two days ago, and I'm going to wow. call her and tell her that. So if you think about, that's a small thing, right? It was retroactively saying, I wish I had done that differently, and I'm so sorry. And she's now has a two-day window instead of a two-year window mm -hmm. to fix something moving forward. And I bet that person who she called and was kinder to, when they get into their next situation where they have someone mm -hmm. whose life they're affecting mm -hmm. in a way that they sort of subconsciously know is super meaningful, will get it down to a day or a minute or not at all. Right. Yeah. You can, you can applaud her for that. <laughs> Uh, there is that kind of saying from self-help, like, hurt people hurt people. So in what you're saying, people who are loving can pass that kindness and that love forward. Yeah, we're all role models for each other. I mean, that's sort of the value of the witness that we saw mm. in, the, in research. It's not just our leaders that are role models. In fact, if you look at some of the greatest movements that are happening in, in the world right now, they're coming from young people. Mm -hmm. And they're coming from people who are sort of acting with their heart and not with power. Mm. And I think power is contained in a lot of forms, but one of the most valuable bits of power that we each have is our own truth. And once you're very aware of that truth, both sharing it vulnerably and openly in, a, in positive and negative ways and seek, seeking the truth in other people rather than trying to make your point or trying to exert some form of control, we become a kinder society. And that's sort of all we have left at this stage mm -hmm. is becoming a kinder society. Not to exert too much control, but we have five minutes left. <laughs> and uh, we will be taking questions in about five minutes for Anne, so you can line up by the microphone um, back there. Um, so as we um, close our discussion, this went by so quickly, I have so yeah. many more things. Um, I and just you've only just started to be really funny. <laughs> we need to do this again. <laughs> sure, sure, we'll, we'll, we'll do the stand-up version. For sure. This. Yes. Um, so I wanted to ask just, uh, I'm going to throw a few things out there. Um, you know, we are, so many of us are feeling maxed out. Uh, we are following political campaigns. We have a homelessness crisis in San Francisco and we don't know how to solve it with kindness and with love. We are maybe taking care of sick family members or trying to get um, kids into the right school and we have to start coaching them from the age of three. Um, there's so many things. In utero. That, uh, yes, that's right, that's <laughs> right. Baby Beethoven in the, yeah. in the stomach. Um, how do we start um, incorporating some of what you've talked about in the book or Parlay House? How do we get involved? And uh, you know, how does everyone in this room do something to kind of move the movement forward, including the men in the audience too? I think it's intimidating to ask the question about changing these huge mm -hmm. problems mm -hmm. that we have. And it's, it's one of the things that I felt was so incredibly mm -hmm. daunting is how do you address inequities between rich and poor? How do you deal with over-incarceration? Mm -hmm. How do we start including people who don't have a voice? And, you know, boy, our government can't figure it out. Some of the smartest people in the world can't figure it out. But you can start on a one-by-one-by-one -by -one -by -one basis. And as we've seen through this crazy cascade that we started to observe uh, as part of the writing of this book, I think that the waves happen pretty quickly. The waves of, I, I was watching the Golden Globes the other night with my daughter, both, both of my girls and I have this sort of history of wearing gowns and watching the Golden Globes <laughs> together, and this was yet another year. Uh -huh. But the amazing thing was whether it was Tom Hanks or Ellen DeGeneres or Brad Pitt, they all were starting to talk about the same thing. Now, I wrote the book first, so just yes. so you know, mm -hmm. they did not come up with this idea. But everybody talked about this idea of kindness and what, what is the small thing, the one small thing that you're going to do to pull someone else forward in some way, go out and be, be kind in some way. And I just think that's, that's the right question to be asking. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we kind of figure out what that is, this either being a witness to something or 
performing act of generosity or just seeing someone. As you said, as we continue to do this, um, how do we get involved uh, for the kind of the perfectionist nerds in the audience, I see you, how do we get involved with Parlay House or how do we support you um, with the book or how do we start doing this in our communities? Everyone's got to make their, their own choice. And it might not be that gathering in a stranger's house with a group of women sounds like your thing. It doesn't have to be. I think everybody, you know, the, in my, my world of worlds, the reason that I wrote this book is I'm limited. I have an amazing right-hand person in Arielle Fuller who I couldn't make Parlay House sing if it was not for her. Mm -hmm. And I have amazing, yeah, and I have amazing friends and family who tell me that it's okay to do, try these crazy things that I'm trying and put myself out there. Mm -hmm. And people, but I can't do that around the world. I mean, we're only in nine cities. We should be in probably every city in the world mm -hmm. to facilitate conversations among people who feel disconnected and isolated and not seen otherwise. So the best thing that could happen is that these small gatherings don't just happen at my house or in our Oakland chapter or in our New York chapter, mm -hmm. but happen where I can't facilitate because we now see the value of bringing strangers into your heart. Mm, beautiful. I have talked a lot. So uh, Crystal, are you... Um set up for taking questions. If anyone has any questions, you can line up back here with me. Um, we do have one from Twitter mm -hmm. for the both of you. Um, who are your role models for kindness and inclusion? You want to go first? Uh, sh uh, sure. Um, you know, uh, what's really interesting, my parents are immigrants, and I talk about them all the time because uh, they drive me crazy, but also because <laughs> they're really wonderful people. My dad... Um, describes uh, coming to the United States as an immigrant, uh, typical story with not that much money, with uh, you know not the right clothes because they immigrated to Chicago. But he grew up very, very poor, and uh, they still had um, some food left over for when people would come and say, we have nothing. So I think that um, having parents who came from abject poverty in the developing world, and then now they live in America. My brother and I went to college and grad school. Uh, we've sort of made it, but I also see that their generosity didn't come from having a lot. It came from, what do I have that I can share? And that is the same generosity that I feel when someone comes into my home. I'm like, do you want this, you know, weird sparkling water or wine or like white claw. I don't know why I have that in my fridge now. <laughs> um, I have a lot of young friends. And so whatever you can offer to people that you have, uh, even if you don't feel like it's enough or good enough, that in and of itself is um, beautiful. And so that's what they taught me. That's amazing. Uh, you know, I have such a range of role models because I have all these different aspects of myself. I fell in love with Brene Brown when mm. we were both speaking at the Watermark Conference for Women a few years ago, and I had never... I was starting to tell my story, but I'd never heard someone sort of be an expert on vulnerability, and that was amazing. But I have other role models, like in the audience is one of my mentees uh, from Cambodia mm. who came here from rural Cambodia with an organization called She Can. She had never been allowed to play a sport. She'd never been outside of her country. And she sort of got on an airplane and said, I'm going to get an education and I'm going to just soak in the world in my four years of being here. And she has. And I don't know if I would have been that brave. So I, I really look up to the risk takers mm. and the ones that sort of say, I'm just going to throw it all mm -hmm. out there and see what happens and fail and learn about myself. And, you know, I think that there's so much that says that we are told as women about achieving and being fitting into models and g looking straight ahead. And we're not allowed to kind of flail. Mm -hmm. We're not allowed to experiment mm -hmm. because if we do, we're promiscuous or we're non-traditional or mm -hmm. we're... But I think I admire the ones who are willing to sort of mess up mm -hmm. and learn. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, we had this, these fascinating conversations because when she first came here and she's an economics major, 
she she said, I want to be the first female economist mm. in my country. Mm. And then when she'd been in the United States for a year and realized that the information she'd been given about her country was not necessarily the global truth, it was what was being told in the country, she had to reframe everything about what her goals were and rethink herself at 20 something years old when she thought she was coming here to get an economics degree to be an economist and do that straight ahead thing. And I think to be tasked at that early age to explode your sense of what will be and recompile it in a way that's truer to yourself and to the reality that you see is one of the bravest things that we mm. can do. Mm. Yes. Hello, Anne. I'm Barbara. I've been a Parlay member for a while, and it's a thrill to be here and to hear the deeper part of your story. Uh, also, a startup founder who has failed and is right back at it again. You. <laughs> Thank you again. My question for you is this. Um, I, as a matter of fact, have a group of strangers coming into my home uh, later this month who are all a, a family council to an elder care facility. It turns out that there are many of these kinds, it's sort of like the inverse of a PTA. There are many of these kinds of organizations that we connect to with community members that we don't really know, but somehow come into together as very vulnerable moments. Do you have plan to have uh, pointers or lessons learned in online communities and things like that that are part of your book? Uh, there are some. It's the book is less about how Parlay House uh, succeeded beyond sort of the experimentation of of inclusion and the topics that work and the topics that sort of didn't work as well. Um, but I can certainly talk to you about it. Um, offline i guess i guess the one thing that i would say is that that um that recognition that everybody's got something important to offer and the listening for it you know i tend to get into a mode where i like i'm talking and i'm on a roll and i you know like that people are listening to me and i forget to listen back and so probably the biggest lesson learned is to allow for that space where no one's saying anything for a few minutes and they're feeling and then someone's going to say something that's much more meaningful than the person who raises their hand first. Great. I look forward to more continuing from here then. Glad to have you. This is our last audience question. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tony Sonato. Um, I feel like lately I've just been kind of going through the rat race of life and kind of losing who I am and kind of forgetting about what, what you know I care about, what my morals are. and being a little bit more self-aware, are there some tools and techniques that you recommend maybe on a daily or weekly basis that we can use to do maybe a self-check-in or reflection with ourselves? Yes, I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert, and, but I think the most important thing for you to do is understand how you learn. So I know people who believe in journaling, whether it's before they go to bed or when they first wake up, to do something positive, to think about the person they want to be. I tend to do, because I'm my own worst critic, I tend to sort of assess at the end of the day, was I able to do something positive, meaningful in some way? If I wasn't, give myself a break, but to think about, well, tomorrow what might I do? Is there that person at work who is kind of alienating themselves because they're just not getting something and I could probably just pull them aside and coach them and they would be doing so much better or I could invite them to lunch or that neighbor that I see that is always sort of combative. If I try to be friendly or offer to pick up their packages when they're left on the front door, will that start to, you know, create a bond where there's been a divide? You know, I just think it's really nice to do a little bit of, of an assessment of how did I do and what can I do better? And then to, you know, maybe write it down. And when you get home, sometimes I stick notes on the mirror. Um, a lot of times my husband leaves me lovely, loving notes on the mirror. But if I want to be my own, my own best uh, self, what's your mental note on the mirror that you can, at the end of the day, answer your own question and feel like you did okay? Thank you so much. Great. Uh, we have um, a tradition. It's, there's an informed tradition to ask all the speakers the same question at the end. So, Anne, what is your 60-second idea to change the world? 
Well, first of all, Spanx and not the brick dress. Okay. <laughs> You can change your outfit and change the world. <laughs> no, I, you know, it, I, I, th I would love for it to be charming and witty and brilliant, but I, I truly think that the idea is find one small thing that you can do as often as possible that helps make someone else feel included, seen, empowered, coached, the beneficiary of of your kindness in some way, it will change them. And I think maybe more importantly, it will give you hope at a time when there's just such little hope. Mm -hmm. One small thing. It was lovely to sit with you here, laugh with you and cry with you and- You weren't crying at all. <laughs> <laughs> on the inside, on the inside, <laughs> I was crying. Um, uh, I want to say a couple more things. Uh, you will be signing the book I will. Uh, in the in the congregating area, the lobby. Um, also, it's available on uh, Amazon. Can I say that you out loud? Can. Okay, okay. You no, can. No, no, no. And and just because I never thought I would be sitting on the stage and saying it, at about noon today, the book reached number one status Ooh. in seven categories on Amazon. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Awesome. And then uh, where can um, people learn more about you as well? Uh, uh, you can you can follow me at Ann Dev Mills. Devereaux is way too long and there are too many vowels. Um, then I'm not going to tell them. Or, uh, you know, whether it's AnnDevereauxMills.com okay. or uh, ParleyHouse.com. There's so many ways. And uh, I have the best social media support ever in my eldest daughter. So you can find us. Great. Yeah. Uh, a huge thank you again to Ann Devereaux Mills, everyone. Thank you for joining us at Inforum at the Commonwealth Club. Please join Anne in the lounge where she will sign copies of her book, The Parlay Effect, How Female Connections Can Change the World. I am Daya Lakshmi Narayanan. You can find me at www.dayacomedy.com. Thank you and have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you for coming.